thank you very much to everybody that's um, joined us today. We really um, very happy that there are people from all over. I know that there's also a number of um, Indian students that are joining us. So um, welcome to everybody to, the, um, to this webinar organized by the South African Society of Systematic um, Biology. Um, we're very pleased to have um, Dr. Benita Gogala here to talk to us, but um, uh, Kelsey will do the, these introductions. Um, from um, Mutama, the president of the society has just asked that we should um, um, give his apologies. He can't make it this afternoon immediately, but um, will will join us if possible. And then um, in in the room, I also have my support team in terms of um, Tuan and um, the director of Fabi Bernard Slippers is also here. So there are a few people, if something happens to me, they, they will be able to take over. So I think without further to do, um, let me hand over to Kelsey and to introduce um, our speakers. Great, thanks, Venice. Thanks everyone for being here today. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Vanita Gauda, who is an associate professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research in Bhopal, India. I've known Vanita for a long time now. We were grad students together at the George Washington University in DC, where then she went on to the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian, and then on to the Singapore Botanical Gardens before her current position at Azar Bhopal. And Vanita has done amazing work through her career with molecular work, ecological work, behavioral work. Her students, I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of years back in Sri Lanka, are really inspirational. So I'm really looking forward to her talk today. Vanita will then be followed by Jess Minar, who's a PhD student in the School of Animal Plant Environmental Sciences, IBITS. And then Camille Frankovich is a postgrad at University of Cape Town, not at WITS, so we can't claim him as our own. So apologies for, for that. But we will, once Vanina is finished, we'll then move into the student talks and I can chair with the questions. So with that, Vanita, please. All right, um, thank you so much, Kelsey. Huh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, just to, to mention that should people have questions, they can type it in the, in the chat box. But at the end of the session, we will also allow people, they can just unmute and ask their questions. Thanks, Dennis. Right. Thank you so much, Kelsey, for that introduction. Uh, like Kelsey said, <laughs> we've known each other for a long time. Um, and I, I guess, yeah, we would, uh, at GW, which, is, which has a very strong history and background for systematics, it was, it was interesting because both me and Kelsey actually did not do hardcore systematics back then, uh, although we were dealing with um, uh, plant taxonomy and, and many other things. So today my talk is um, kind of, um, let me just share my screen. Um, as you have seen it in the abstract probably, it focuses on, uh, so you can see the screen, right? So um, I'm focusing on, um, or, or when, when I moved back to India, one of the things, or why my sort of the thrust of why I moved back to India was to try to understand uh, what biodiversity is and, and you know, how can we define uh, diversity uh, when your taxonomy is not good. So that sort of bothered me a lot. So one of the first projects that I started in India was on systematics of, of uh, hedicium and this is what you see here in the in the image here these are all hedicums which is a ginger from the northeast of india predominantly in the northeast of india some are also found in the western Ghats. so i'm going to use uh, uh, the past nine years of the research that has gone on in my lab to sort of address this big question of how do we understand uh, generation, evolution, and maintenance of plant biodiversity, and in my case, specifically in India. 
Uh, so all of you, I mean, if, if there are students or anyone, uh, potential collaborators, if you're interested in writing to me, my email address is, uh, you can officially find me at Vinita Gauda and Aisar Bhopal, uh, IISERB Bhopal that is. And so, you know, this is my email address and my Twitter handles. So pretty much everything that I'm going to present here uh, is all student uh, work of PhD students as well as master students. Um, all, reasonably most of them are here. I have not, I'm not showing all the master students who've also been uh, major contributors to a lot of uh, the research that has gone on. So two of the first students have already graduated. And so the majority of the first part of my work is going to come from their uh, doctoral work. Um, and then uh, a later part is uh, uh, Saket here, whose uh, master's and PhD work um, has also contributed to that part of the story. So my entire talk is divided into two stories, one where I'm going to talk about uh, Hidikim, this genus that I talked about, which you see the images here, uh, which is a ginger, and a second ginger called Curcuma. So this one will deal with phylogeny and how we're looking at taxonomy now and integrating these two um, large fields. And the curcuma story, if I get to that, and if I have enough time, is, is about floral color polymorphism because you know variation in plants is 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 also in morphology, and color is one of the first things that we usually score or we identify any organism with, especially in plants. So how this floral color polymorphism sort of uh, links into the 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 taxonomy and other sort of population level issues that we have. So. Uh, I don't have to necessarily say this to this audience, but just to just because it will get complex very soon. So I'm just sort of re, uh, sort of reminding everyone specifically that taxonomy. When we say taxonomy, it's the scientific organization of living or once living but now extinct organisms, which means that fossils can also have names and so can uh, living organisms. And everybody all know who Linnaeus is and what his contributions have been in taxonomy in general. But I like to sort of think about uh, taxonomy in the simplistic form format that is um, you know when we when we have uh, when 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 we're small or when we have kids who are under three one of the tests that we use for their sort of uh, neurological sort of cognizance is give them color blocks and we try to sort uh, we require we kind of expect them to sort it out and that kind of tells how, whether they can tell shapes apart and what kind of you know sort of neurological co cognizance they have uh, sort of a part of their behavioral sort of development so if you give a child sort of all of these different shapes and you ask them to sort it, the first thing they are going to do is sort it in the four basic shapes that were available. That is, you know, triangles go together, circles go together. And then this is a little bit more complex because both of them are squares. And if the child can arrange it in this form, it means that the child has understood the sort of, you know, um, the corners or, or the complexity in the corners that's, uh, that's available here. So that is one is smooth, has a smooth corner and the other one has more sort of sharp corners. So that shows another level of complexity that the child has now understood in terms of arranging the, the, the blocks that they have. Now, as, as botanists or as, as, as taxonomists and phylogeneticists, that's precisely what we're doing. We're just sorting the, the plants that we have around the world and we're just sort of, um, you know, reassigning them in plants that look similar in some form. And that's where taxonomy sort of started off with. And, these re and those, those sort of organizations can be reorganized into more similar, you know, um, plants where you kind of start identifying these are gymnosperms, these are monocots, and these are dicots, and so on and so forth. Now, where we come now into the picture with systematics is we are just going to draw this arrow, you know, from, from this previous reorganization. What we are doing going to do is have connecting arrows, which kind of suggests you know, what is the evolutionary route or like what is the ancestor sort of, you know, it's not necessarily to mean that gymnosperms, um, uh, monocots came from gym gymnosperms, but we like to see the trajectory of how species evolved, which is add the time component to it. And this is sort of very, very important um, aspect because that's where we bring in the question of evolution of traits, evolution of taxa and evolution of characters uh, that we're interested in. And of course, then we end up with this nice phylogeny of all land plants and, and, and that brings us to the question, so what do we do at, at the tree lab at Iser Bhopal? And what is our sort of approach of understanding this diversity that is, is present in tropics? And how do we go about uh, understanding uh, different aspects of diversity? First of all, what is important in understanding diversity? In my lab and, and, and for me, right now it's about 
what creates diversity, that is different processes that may result in diversity in taxa. The second is how, we, how is it maintained? That is what are ecological factors that help maintain these diverse, diverse characters. So overall, uh, uh, most of my students who are interested in systematics, we will have the integrative taxonomy approach that we go through literature, find the taxonomic sort of uh, background to the group. We build a phylogeny. Once the phylogeny is built, which is usually with whatever is, you know, methods are available, most of the time we use molecules, both chloroplast and, and nuclear. We build the phylogeny and from the phylogeny, we go into character evolution, age of the group, that is you're dating it, and also the origin of the group that is, you know, biogeographic sort of uh, uh, aspects as well. And all of this, then we again want to link it back to taxonomy because we started off with names. We started our diversity indices is, is dependent on the name. That is, if I define 20 names, then that is how you're going to define the diversity of a region. If I now shrink from 20 names to 10, then your diversity has in some sense gone down. Or if I go from 20 to 40, then it has gone up. So we do want to sort of link up all of this thing that we're doing with taxonomy, which is that basic thing where we're actually just naming uh, organisms. So of course, um, um, uh, if if you've gone through my website, you may real uh, you may have noticed that you know we do have I do have a sort of uh, or the lab has a strong bias to work on gingers, although that is not the only group that we work on. We also have now uh, projects in Disney C and, and other dicots, um, dicot taxa and also sort of community level studies. Uh, and this is sort of a rhizogram, which is basically sort of a uh, sort of a. Um, um, interesting way of calling, you know, the entire um, uh, phylogeny of, of the Zingiberellus order. And just for uh, uh, everyone who may not know, so uh, gingers is somewhere here. This is the Zingiberellus here. Uh, are you able to see my arrow by any chance? You can see my cursor, right? Or no? No, I didn't see it moving Look across. Oh, 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 sorry. Hang on. Let me just see where is the cursor. How do I do that? Uh, okay, wait, let me, sorry. Annotate, right? Uh, spotlight, that's the one, right? Now you can see? Can you see it now? Now we're good. Yep. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay. So this is the Zin. Sorry about that. I didn't realize. So this is the Zingibrasi here. Just move this. Uh oh. Now it went off again. Did you? It went right. Oh, hang on. I need to keep that bar. Sorry. One second. Uh, it's back. It's back, right? Okay. Uh, so yeah, so uh, the Zingiberaceae is right here, and as you can see, this entire group is the Zingiberellus order, and so it's also related in some form to the bananas and the heliconias and the cannas, uh, which are which are present here, and the costas, which is the spiral gingers that you they have very nice phyllotaxy in it. Um, so it's a very uh, diverse group, uh, dominantly Asian um, in, in many form, although Heliconia is predominantly uh, South American with roots in, um, uh, in, in uh, Polynesia and, and Asia. So, of course, like I said, um, when we talk phylogeny, it is, it's, not, it's going to be more complex because what we are right now building is phylogenies across Asia because India, as you know, it has been a raft that came out of African sort of uh, connections and, and then hit the Eurasian plate. And then, uh, so that was one, one part of its life. The previous life was sort of being with Africa and, and that uh, continent. And then the raft phase where it was, you know, a lot of, you know, taxa sort of evolved while it was disconnected from any sort of uh, connecting land masses. And then the hitting with the Eurasia and then sort of the coming in of taxa from Southeast Asia and also from Eurasia. So the history is very, very complex when it uh, comes to um, uh, Indian flora and fauna. And, and so most of our phylogenies do involve uh, taking taxa across Southeast Asia because we're interested in the biogeography of how um, the taxa sort of spread um, uh, uh, around Asia. So the uh, ultimate goal is to really sort of build this multiple phylogenies or, you know, across taxa, um, across multiple taxa so that we get an idea of how, to, what, what shaped the biogeography and the diversity of flora in Western Ghats, which is the, one of the biodiversity hotspots and uh, sort of Eastern Himalayas, which is the second biodiversity hotspot in India. So because we have that advantage of having two hotspots completely different looking and in two different uh, regions, which are not necessarily uh, directly con connected. It gives us a lot of opportunities to sort of uh, ask these questions on, uh, on, on biodiversity and how, how this di uh, diversity has, uh, has been created.
So I'll give you the gist of the first part of my story. And, uh, and because, I mean, students may be there and therefore I kind of have put the first word uh, in a small that sexual promiscuity is really good for diversity. And I think you will have to just sort of take my word on this before I actually introduce why I say that. And of course, I will highlight that when I say sexual promiscuity, of course, I'm talking in plants, just so that there's a disclaimer of, you know, uh, of, of sort of extrapolating it anywhere else. Um, so why is sexual promiscuity uh, important in diversity in plants? So all of our studies, like I said, is on this zingiberaceae. This is how the gingers uh, look. Morphologically, they're very, very diverse. And the hedicum, the one genus that I'm going to talk about uh, briefly, is uh, present in all of um, the Himalayan sort of region um, and, and uh, northeast of India, which is here, and also extends all the way to Southeast Asia. This is um, Indonesian islands and, and, and Philippines. And you can see here that there's one dot or uh, rather a few dots in, in Western Ghats as well, which means that it's present in Western Ghats, but the diversity is not very high. So you can see immediately that clearly the taxa or the genus has a strong sort of Southeast Asian flavor to it and, and has has a history to them. So Ajit, uh, my first student, uh, did a phylogeny and uh, this, this work is already published now. And so I will just get to the phylogeny part a little quickly because I mean, everyone here is a systematist. So I thought that it was not important to focus on the phylogeny so much as to what happens next after the phylogeny. So what Ajit discovered with, uh, with this phylogenetic study is that they all, almost all the, we had about 75 to 76% um, taxa sampled across Southeast Asia. Uh, the entire genus can now be divided into at least um, uh, four major groups. Uh, if you see the clades, then it's really five because we're calling the second clade as two uh, densiflorum and two ellipticum. As a, we, we were not able to specifically resolve how they were uh, related to each other. But you can see that one of the basal clades here is called the spicatum, and then there is a uh, clade two, then the clade three, which is dominated by uh, uh, by one species, which is called which we have, uh, we are calling it a villosum clade because of traits, and the fourth is this coronarium clade. Now the fourth clade is where we are interested in because all of Indian taxa comes under most of them come under the fourth clade, and you can see that it's also the largest, right? So but the the base of the triangle shows the diversity of taxa present in it. So in a sense, when we started the project, we were interested in this clade four and turned out that clade four is still the unresolved clade because of the diversity and also because of this, this part that you see here, that is the age of the group. You can see that it's, it's the entire genus turned out to be quite recent. Uh, the base here shows 10.6 million e um, uh, years ago and the clade four is only about four. 0.9 or 5 million years ago, which is very, very recent by all standards. So one of the first discoveries was that this genus is not very old. A second was that we could actually see sort of some kind of a biogeographic uh, 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 characteristics where it looks like uh, the northern Indo-Burma region was the center of uh, diversity and, and all the uh, sort of uh, uh, dispersal events happened from this uh, southern uh, Indo-Burma region into India, uh, into other parts of Southeast Asia and so on and so forth. The third major result that we found was that there were two different factors uh, that were very important, or rather three different factors that were most important for the diversity of the taxa within this genus. So here the x-axis is the time factor, which is millions of years. The y-axis is the number of taxa. So with time, we are, this, this graph just shows what is the accumulation of taxa um, uh, and what are the, uh, we sort of map the uh, sort of uh, climatic and, and geological events that could be correlated with this increase that you see from, from here to here, you can see that it, the slope is actually increasing. So the one of the first factors here that we sort of identified out of all the suite of uh, characters and, and factors that were available was uh, sort of the, the Himalayan origin, that the Himalayan sort of play, uh, uh, the mountains sort of um, rose. And of course, it's a very, this is a very, very complex geological sort of hypothesis uh, because you have to re uh, remember that the Tibetan plateau was already very high when the Himalaya uh, arose. So there is a little bit of complexity here, but one of the factors we think strongly that would have caused why we see this high diversity in clade four, that is the Indian clade, is because of this formation of this uh, Himalayan uh, mountains. Second is the intensification of the rain. Now all of gingers are very much rain dependent, extremely they like 
uh, wet tropics, they, you don't find gingers in, in dry uh, regions. In fact, they, they sort of are, so are, are very, very sensitive to, desic and, and, uh, to desiccation when in, in uh, dry environments and hot environments. So the intensification of monsoon, which sort of succeeded this um, Himalayan origin, may have made the environment more conducive for um, uh, taxa that were, um, that were rain dependent. And third is sort of this glaciation event, uh, which may have given a sort of a, a, a certain sort of rise in the total number of taxa that were present in these specific regions, that is the northeast of India and, and, uh, and surrounding regions in Southeast Asia. And so these three combined is what we think has possibly resulted in this high sort of uh, diversity that we see in the Indian um, sort of part of uh, this entire story, which is here, the northeast of India. So this is a closer look of how it looks in terms of the biogeography or the dispersal story. So this is the northern Indo-Burma. And again, this is all work of uh, Ajit, uh, who's here in this image here. So from northern Indo-Burma, the, the, the size of the triangle head, uh, the head of the uh, sort of uh, arrow tells you that the, this was a large number of taxa are now uh, expected to have dispersed from uh, this particular uh, region that is D. If the, um, and also the direction tells you where specifically it has gone. So you can see that there's a massive sort of um, uh, shift uh, or dispersal of taxa from uh, northern Indo-Burma into what we now identify as the Himalayan region. This is the Hengduan mountain region in China and so on and so forth. And there has been one dispersal event also from D to A, which is the Western Ghats. Now we have purposefully drawn this uh, arrow uh, over the waters and not over the land because we really don't have, we aren't sure if the taxa actually came to Northeast of India and dispersed from there, or there was a, a direct sort of a route. So this is a question that still remains to be unanswered and we kind of chose um, uh, for multiple reasons to show it over the water because we could, um, uh, there, were, there were sort of assumptions that, you know, the landmass here, this is sort of the Sunda land that you see here. All of these islands are submerged uh, uh, landmasses. That is, these are all connected uh, at one point about 10 million years ago, causing this uh, large Sunda land area. And then as the, as the uh, uh, water levels rose, we now see this formation of this Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and you can see how it's really very closely related to the or connected to the Sumatran Islands uh, of, of Indonesia. So we therefore kept this hypothesis over the water for now before we have more evidence to show that uh, taxa in Western Ghats may have come to Northeast and then traveled through Northeast into A. So there, there, are, there are a few more uh, sort of mountain ranges in the central India here, uh, which could have been barriers or could have also facilitated this movement. But this is a hypothesis that remains to be still tested uh, in our work. So once we had done the sorting um, uh, of these um, of these taxa, uh, or, or, or we uh, had the phylogeny, our next question was, uh, what do we do uh, with all of this study that we did? And one of the features that we uh, we struggled with while doing the phylogeny was the actual identification of taxa, that is the taxonomy behind it. So one of the features that we found was that in any field site that we went to, we saw that there was a range of morphological, that the, the, the morphologies that we found in the field uh, were continuous. And I'm sure everyone who has done field work and has worked with with uh, with morphological characters, you know, has faced this that you know there's, everything is a continuum, and to find that break is not as easy as we would like it to be. So two of the major sort of um, uh, continuum that we see is from Gardnerianum to Coccinium. This is one genus, one species here, the far end, and then Coccinium. So if you find Gardnerianum to Coccinium, this is sort of the range of intermediate forms that you see in the in the wild. The other one we have identified now as marginatum to stenopetalum. This is marginatum here. This is stenopetalum, and this is sort of the intermediate forms that you see. Now. As a taxonomist, you could, or, or if you're an expert in this group, you could go ahead and identify each one of these individuals as different species, because as you can see, there are differences in characters, okay? So in some sense, the person who will sort this kind of a continuum are taxonomists, right? And 
it kind of looks simple because you can see that if I sent you the voucher specimens of each one of them uh, and, and I didn't give you the GPS readings of these taxa, then they do look significantly different enough that you will start identifying them as different species. So technically you can identify all of these taxa as six different species and same in the second row as well. So you can say that it is simple, but for someone who has dealt with these in the wild, we kind of now have come to the conclusion that uh, identification of taxa which show continuum is extremely complex. Complex, So it's not as simple as, as we would like to uh, see it. And, and this cartoon sort of summarizes what may end up being with the Hidikium in the long run. Uh, and this is just basically, you know, a fish talk uh, where there's a very sad looking fish family on the top and the, there are two fishes commenting on them and they're sort of uh, talking about their status with, where, where they go. They're going through a difficult time because half of their family has been split off into a new genus. And this is a taxonomic sort of nightmare when you want to split or, or lump taxa uh, or, and make a statement saying, well, your existence really is very difficult and very complex for us to understand. And so this is what sort of we dealt with in the last nine years to kind of understand how, uh, what was happening with the genus Hidikim. And um, as everyone knows, um, when we get confused with molecules and all our all of our phylogeny was based on molecules, uh, we always go back to morphology. And, and, and this is where, uh, uh, I would like to sort of insist why we really need to continue uh, focusing on morphology as much as molecules, although of course uh, the jobs and uh, fancy results are do exist in the genomic world, but oftentimes uh, what we are really grappling with when it comes to biodiversity is identifying the taxa in the wild. And most of our you know, resources are limited. And in, while I can do a lot of genomic work, I think the strength of my lab and my, and my group is that we try to mix both morphology and, and ecology and uh, molecules to try to get to the answer um, uh, quickly and also in a much more robust way. So why do we go to morphology? Because these are the observable units of any species. It's essential because you can think of it as, you know, you can do transcriptome work, but then again, you know, what you see in the wild is exactly what has survived. So it has already gone through that evolutionary sort of filtering. So it is, morphology is essentially an expression of the genetic material that the organisms have or the plants have. And also plus they have already gone through the selection process. Uh, we're also, of course, interested in character evolution. I, I mean, how do different flowers, why do different flowers look different within the same genus? And, and this entire genus, Hidikium, is extremely fragrant. One of the rare gingers where uh, the flower itself is fragrant. So in most gingers, while fragrance is there in the flowers, you, as you know, for, from the edible ginger, as well as turmeric and few others, um, it's the fruit or the, or the rhizome or the leaves that is, that is very, very fragrant. But in Hidikium, the flower itself is very fragrant. And so there has been a standing hypothesis that uh, the diurnal plants, that, uh, that is plants that open in the daytime, may be pollinated by butterflies and birds. And the nocturnal plants, uh, nocturnal uh, species, may be pollinated by moths and, and, and bats. So this fragrance has, was something that was also important for our work, although I'm not going to focus on it uh, too much here. But uh, so that was one character that we were really interested in seeing, like how does the fragrance and similar floral characters, uh, how they may have facilitated evolution of this entire genus. And of course, one of the, uh, like I said, one of the fundamental question has been, what is a species? So when you see a continuum of this kind, uh, which one will you, what criteria will you use to identify these taxa as, as, as uh, different species? And, and, for, and as everyone knows, for some taxa, you know, we only, for fossils, you just have morphology. So really, in some sense, morphology is extremely key um, to uh, continue working on it and, and, and studying. So you can see here, this is one of the morphologies that I would like to sort of focus on. So there are three species, Stenopatalum, Bordelin, and, um, and Radiatum. And we, in, in, gin, in Hidikiums particularly, and in most gingers as well, which have this inflorescence, which is this entire structure where flowers are, are, are born, um, the sexual uh, reproductive part. Uh, you can see that in this, we call this as involute uh, sort of um, uh, inflorescence, where you can see that each of these bracts, this green structure that you see is the bract and it's folded. You can see it's all, almost like a tubular structure, but it's not a tube, it's, it's actually open, but it's just sort of curled. Uh, this is the other extreme, which is called imbricate, where you can see that the bracts are overlapping with each other. This, this is the same bract as this green here. 
And then you will start seeing this intermediate forms where it's partly folded and partly like at the bottom, you can see they seem to form sort of an involute structure. And as you go up the inflorescence, they start forming this imbricate structure. So depending on when you saw that inflorescence open or how, what is the stage of the inflorescence and when the plant was pressed by any collector, you may actually identify this intermediate forms as involute or imbricate or, 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 or really a new, uh, new character. So therefore, it was very important for us when we saw sort of um, intermediate forms in the wild to actually uh, do an extensive morphology. So a closely related spe uh, species um, um, uh, uh, where morphological boundaries are not fixed are identified as species complexes. And so in a while we were doing the phylogeny of, of the Hidikium, we identified sets of species complexes based on ecological work that was carried out because we did extensive field work in, in all of Northeast and, and Western Ghats. So here I'm just showing you the example of, again, a species complex, again, defined because closely related taxa cannot be distinguished based on just pure morphology. So here you again see Gardnerianum coccinium complex. This is Gardnerianum, this is coccinium, and this is sort of roughly a less than 100 meter distance uh, somewhere in Arunachal Pradesh where you can see these intermediate forms. Now, if I didn't tell you that this was the distance was very less uh, or, or what the distance was, you may actually assume all of them to be very different. But the minute I give you this ecological sort of information that these are this, this intermediate forms are very next to each other, I think that will help you sort of make this decision that probably I should not be describing them as new different species because they may be hybridizing, which is very common in plants. Same thing with marginatum and stenopetalum. This is in, in, in Nagaland. What you see here is, is in even lesser distance, which is less than 50 meters. You see that you have marginatum, you have stenopetalum, and you have all of these intermediate forms. Now, interestingly, one of these intermediate form right here has been described as a new species as, as, as uh, and, and you know it's 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 now a valid taxa the important thing is that we in the wild we have not when we went back and looked at this new species which is called nagamians because it's from nagaland so it was named after uh, the state uh, what we noticed is that not only nagamians is bit is very close to these two parental, so-called potential parental forms, that is marginatum is on the other side of the road and stenopatum was right next to it. And then we saw this nagamians. But we also noticed that nagamians, this new species that was described and now is a valid taxa, did not set fruit. Now, sterility in hybrids is, is, is very common. So one of our suspicion now is that this is a hybrid and, the, and since most hybrids are sterile, uh, that's why we have not found fruits in it. So one may ask, why is this, how did we find the taxa? Well, gingers are perennial plants. So it, the only thing that a hybrid needs to do is somehow stay alive and form a rhizome. So it's possible that the entire population of Naga means is clonal and that the propagation is only through rhizomes and not through fruits because in, in, in past four or five years, we have not seen any fruits in this, in this taxa. So if I give you these kind of ecological information, it now again adds, um, to your sort of uh, informed decision on whether I really should be calling this a new species or not. So this is where we prefer to, or we, we now have evolved to sort of um, thinking of species as not just from phylogeny and taxonomy, but also from ecological studies that we do. And so if you thought that the you know, complexes are only linear because going from one end to the other, uh, what we soon found out that it's, it's a triangle for possibly a pentagon, possibly a hexagon, and maybe even multidimensional for that matter. And this is what Preeti found, and Preeti is here. Again, she's my second student who graduated uh, recently. So Preeti was more interested in the ecology, and so she sort of was interested in seeing you know, what is going on when two taxa are close by, and, and you know, what is the, the interconnections. And so this is what she found in, in, in that sexual promiscuity is good for diversity because when taxa are found close together, so now Preeti has identified not just the complexes which go marginatum stenopatalum. Now we have complexes which go coronarium marginatum stenopatalum complex and it's a triangle as you can see. And why is it a triangle? Because in some sense, everything can mate with everything. And that we have done crosses. She did uh, extensive crosses in the wild to see which crosses set fruit. And also she went, went through extensive crosses to make sure that coronarium is the male donor in one part, in one of the cross. And, and in another co uh, cross, coronarium is the female or the receiver of the, of the uh, interspecies uh, crosses. 
And again, we found more complexes like the spicatum complex uh, that you can see here and the coccinium uh, gardnerianum complex that you've already, uh, I already mentioned before. So what we have now moved from is just, you know, sort of linear sort of identification of taxa to species complexes and within species complexes, it has become complex of complexes, you know, it's like very, very, uh, very, very sort of uh, difficult to sort of identify these things. Now, uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, this is more so for non botanists uh, than botanists that I think, uh, you know, plants are absolutely wonderful because they can do pretty much anything that you have ever imagined. And this is a good example of this, that, you know, 100 years of, of, of breeding has resulted in this one species called Brassica oleracea into dozens of different varieties. And these varieties are what you may identify as, as vegetables in, uh, in their own form. And you may think that these are different species. They're not. These are specifically just different vegetables where different parts were selected for because that's what was um, sort of uh, selected for consumption. So the same species has flower buds developing into, the, into what we know as cauliflower. When flower buds plus stems gives you broccoli, when you have terminal leaf bud, such as this one here, which, uh, uh, which develops into what, what we now identify as cabbage, lateral leaf buds into Brussels sprouts and so on and so forth. So just to give an idea that plants can do anything. And so that's where sort of we sort of started off and had to keep an open mind to say that, you know, plants can do anything, species complexes therefore can be influenced by anything that's happening in the wild. So one of the question for, for that clade four, which you remember is the, is the largest clade of hedicums in, um, in, in the entire genus. Uh, what our main question was, why are there so many species in, in, in this clade? And of course, like what I showed you from the species complexes, one of them is that clearly there's a lot of hybridization going on in the, in the wild. And therefore, you know, the variations in characters is very high. Um, and diversity in morphologies has its advantages in the sense that, you know, there will, can be better selection sort of uh, regimes that one can think of in the wild. And in, in our case, uh, we kind of were also interested in knowing if, uh, what, if there were specific ecological factors that were driving this di uh, diversity. So uh, the chance, and then there's also always this chance factor of who came first in the sense of, you know, did, did the taxa come first and then diversify in the Northeast of India? Because remember I said it came from the Indo-Burma region. So did it come from Indo-Burma and then diversify or it diversified in Indo-Burma and then arrived? So these are all sort of questions that we sort of were interested in. And so um, Preeti in her uh, doctoral work took this integrative sort of taxonomy sort of approach where she looked at the reproductive ecology also the chemical ecology, because once we knew that hybrids were being formed and there was fragrance involved and we were using fragrance as an important taxonomic character, we also decided that we're going to sort of now uh, look at the fragrance and see if we are calling X and Y as parental forms, if the hybrid also had intermediate fragrance and, and therefore the ecology is different. And why is fragrance related to ecology? Because we were assuming or we are assuming that pollinators are going to be important in hybridization events. That is the pollinator is, ex is attracted to a specific fragrance, comes to that particular taxa and then moves on to the other one. And there may be some interconnecting relationship therefore between the chemical ecology of the plant, the hybridization events, and also propagating that hybridization in the wild. So we did all of these, or rather that we have done, we are doing the, we've done the reproductive ecology, chemical ecology. Uh, my uh, uh, current student Anupama is, is going to explore about uh, on, on how the chemical ecology and chemical characters are important. And Alina, my other, uh, my current PhD student is also looking at genomics and population genetics and how it influences uh, this, uh, the, the entire uh, complex formation. So this is what we did in the wild for the ecology bit. We took the morphology, we scored about 150 morphological characters. We looked at scent, nectar, you know, flowering phenologies, fruit sets, you name it. We used manual and camera traps to find pollinators. She did massive crosses in the wild. And then we also had the molecular phylogeny anyways. So I'll just show you just to give you an idea of what I mean by complexes and why reproductive biology is so important for uh, us to understand what's happening in terms of um, uh, creation of diversity and taxonomic diversity. So I just let me know if you cannot actually see the, the file here, but oh gosh, oh, not this, sorry, not this, oh. It's a link, Vin. Is there a file that yeah. comes? Yeah. No, I'll, I'll share it again. I'll one second. I'll share the file. Uh, one second. 
um, it's an online file. Just give me a minute. Okay, so I'll share it again. Uh, so uh, you're not able to see anything right now, right? So let me just go and share again. No. Share where is the share file? Uh, for share. Okay, this is new share. Okay. Uh, All right. Are you able to see this? No, I can see your, your slides. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can there you we go. Now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So are you able to see a uh, uh, network? No. Or are you able to see? Oh, no. Hang on. One second. Stop share. Let me, let me just do, do it again. One second. Share. And this. And share. Okay. Like, are you able to see a network now? Yes. Yeah, okay. So this, this network here uh, shows you uh, the crosses that were done by Preeti in order for us to understand what is the interspecies, like how are these complexes formed and what is the interspecies interactions. So on here, the first uh, uh, set of uh, taxa on the left side you see are the maternal group of plants and on the right side you see the paternal plants. And what you need to now see is, okay, let me see where is that annotate, one second, let me find the spotlight, okay. Uh, all right, so you here is the maternal plant, these are the paternal plants. Now, as I go through each species, it will show you the links that the species has in terms of the fruit sets and which taxa it can actually, it, it actually resulted in fruit set. So if I say coronarium, it, uh, you know, when it was maternal, um, it can, uh, uh, it resulted in fruits when it was mated with coronarium, that is the same species, forestii, which is the next species, which is part of the complex, and stenopatellum, which is the third species. Now you can do the reverse as well, that we did the paternal part of when, when this was the pollen donor, and then coronarium could cross with again coronarium forestia and stenopatellum. And so we built these sort of networks for all the taxa that you're seeing here, most of which are part of this large complexes, species complexes that we identified. And one of the most notorious complex is the spicatum here that you see. And you can see here that when it's spicatum is the pollen donor, it interacts with at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven taxa. And when it's working as a female um, uh, donor or is the recipient, then it again uh, the, uh, 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 interacts with more than seven taxa, but they are not the same. So you can see that these are asymmetrical uh, in terms of when it's a polar, when the same species of, is a pollen donor and when it is the maternal plant, that is it is receiving the pollen. This asymmetry is very important because it's not very uh, extensively known or studied in plants, although I'm sure every botanist will accept that this happens. But to try to sort of like decipher this species by species in the wild is, is something that is, has been quite fascinating for us. And so we've done this now for all the taxa that you see here. And what the, the ultimate sort of uh, uh, outcome of this, this analysis is that we now know that most of these hidicums can cross with multiple species. And the color here is by clades. So this, this is one clade, this is another clade, and this is another clade, and this is fourth clade. What it means is that these crosses are also happening across clades. And remember that this, this entire uh, group is only about seven to 10 million years old. So clearly the reproductive boundaries have not been set, which probably is resulting in this kind of sort of admixture that you see across you know, different clades and within the genus. So this is, the, this is what is, uh, uh, we, have, we have now arrived at is causing this uh, diversity that we talk about um, is, uh, of, uh, of, of plants and, one second, let me just share that. Okay. Uh, uh, can you see the slide now? You can, right? Uh, you yeah. can see, my, I'm, I'm back to the slides. Okay. So this is, has been one of our sort of major sort of uh, uh, eye-opening sort of uh, result that, you know, uh, the diversity that we're talking about is specifically driven by lack of, uh, you know, uh, 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 reproductive boundaries between the taxa. Also, because this is a very young group and therefore these boundaries have not been established and therefore we see this massive sort of, you know, uh, presence of, of diverse, diverse taxa, especially in Northeast India, which is, or, or in India, uh, which is the youngest group among all the, all the hidicums. So uh, because we were sort of having this extreme difficulty in identifying taxa, uh, 
purely by going simple morphology because most of the time we, we ended up being quite biased because you look at the plant and you start making this thing you know when you have two species from the same location you tend to think that they look different and then when you bring in a third species from a completely different state um, you know you, you start getting confused about it so we used a very uh, new approach to identify morphological characters among these species complexes so this is how your standard nmds or, or cluster analysis will look like that you will form a cluster and and you know sort of oh, sorry. sorry you form a cluster and you know the different clusters are are being identified uh, uh, based on how you draw the circle around the cluster. So this circle around the cluster is is really sort of biased because that's influenced by your taxonomic sort of background. So in order to remove the bias, we did this uh, unsupervised sort of machine learning approach to identify clusters in our data sets, which included this taxonomic complex, those those continuum of characters. And what we found is that we were able to cluster. Has most of the species complex into four to six clusters. So even the machine learning approach sort of gave us a range of complexes or range of taxa within a complex, which is, you know, biologically meaningful because clearly there is no boundary and that we should not be forced to make those boundaries. But what is also interesting about this new method that we we now, it's, it's now published in plant apps is that uh, we were able to identify which morphological characters are important for each of these clusters. So let's say for if you find that this, you can see just uh, I, I, while the image is not very great, I think you can roughly see that there are different colors. So imagine that different colors is what is one cluster. And for each, you know, what is interesting and important about machine learning approaches is that within the same analysis, the different clusters can be identified or be supported by a complete different set of characters. So while one cluster, for instance, here could be uh, floral color could be important for in the same analysis, you will find another cluster where it's not floral color, it's 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 the bract shape or the bract size and so on and so forth. While in most cluster analysis, uh, such as NMDS and, and TCA, what we find is like two dimensions, dimension one and dimension two, and they are, the dimensions are usually defined by the same characters. And that's where this method is a little more advanced in the sense that the same cl uh, cluster analysis can be defined by completely different character sets. So this has been sort of uh, interesting and important for us to identify what should be the upper limit of the species complexes and how many species should we actually uh, include in each complex. So like I said, uh, the VOCs or the, or the volatile compounds uh, was something which is also important for the Hedicums because, you know, these are fragrant plants. And so Preeti also did some preliminary study, which we are now expanding. And, and like I said, Anpama is sort of has taken it and is hopefully planning to do it for the entire genus. But this is sort of pre preliminary results. And you can see that, you know, you can see here the black cluster the yellow uh, sort of or the, or the uh, you know uh, dirty yellow cluster and the green cluster there are few clusters that can be identified but then there is also this green and red which really is quite um, uh, uh, mixed in terms of its volatile profiles so what we are now interested in is, is looking at this hybrid and and species complexes and seeing if characters such as volatile compounds can also be different because for any any sort of and the reason it's part of uh, is interesting for us is also from uh, what initial uh, you know uh, someone asked is about you know how if these are all edible gingers you know what are the uh, traits that one we can exploit or use in in taking this wild species into cultivation and 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 therefore and and explore the medicinal properties that they may be having so this is sort of sort of a preliminary glimpse into it and um, just to show you how complex the genetic structuring is within this species complex. This is how our DDRAD sequencing results looks like. This is not a pretty result if anyone knows what a DDRAD or, or a population genetic structure is supposed to look like. Uh, this is output of uh, the structure analysis and you can see here technically you want to see nice you know, groups of colored uh, bands, which says that this is population one, this is, you know, this green is population two, red is population three. But instead what we see is also a continuum here of, of, of uh, uh, taxa uh, or colors, which means that, and these, these numbers here, which it really doesn't matter uh, what species it is, I think you will have to uh, trust me on, on face value that um, these are coming from a single species complex called spicatum. So we have intermediate forms here, I, if I'm not mistaken, this one here is an intermediate form and this one here, 21, 22, 23 is also a unique form. So there is some kind of a signature in varietal forms that we have now identified within a species complex, but overall you can see that 
that when you even if you do the genomic analysis, it presents pretty much the same uh, result as what we have seen from ecology and morphology that it is very complex and characters are all over the place. And that is hybridization may actually be happening across the board uh, within a species complex. And so, yeah, like I said, this is one uh, one of the uh, uh, characters that, or one of the varietal forms that, oh, sorry, I cannot actually see myself where I am. Uh, mouse. Okay, hang on. Yeah, okay, so yeah, this is, these are the two sort of varietal forms. Oh, oh now I lost my spotlight, hang on. Can you see my cursor? No. I I no. Oh, I sort of lost my cursor, hang on. Uh, wait, how did I lose this? All right, anyway. okay. All right. But I still lost my cursor. Do I go back? One second, sorry for this. I lost the Okay, anyway. sorry, I'll just sort of go ahead with it if you don't mind me not using the sort of cursor or the spotlight. For some reason, it's not allowing me to go back. Uh, I'll try to sort of be more descriptive about it. So, so that brings us to sort of why we concluded that sexual promiscuity is good for diversity, because we now think that at least for the Hedekians, um, this lack of reproductive barriers or having this leaky reproductive barriers is what is one of the primary factor of why there are so many species within this genus, especially in the Northeast uh, biogeographic region. Uh, and and what is what we found is that not every taxa is promiscuous. There are there are few taxa which are notorious in their promiscuity, and they are the ones which are hybridizing across the board within uh, within the genus. And it has got nothing to do with if that particular taxa is in the older clade or in the more recent clade or, or in the early diverging clade and so on and so forth. We haven't found any correlations therefore. And so we think that seven million years is really too recent for us to make such sort of judgments in, in this plant group. Um, we also found that characters such as uh, volatile compounds may play an important part because again we need to link it to ecology but we think that there may be a link there and integrations of genes is very high like i showed in the species complex the structure plot uh, where we use the dd rad sequencing uh, sequences are, is that it's the integration is so high that we are not really able to see any clear molecular signatures although there are some um, highlighted signatures uh, that are coming out so I think I will stop here, unfortunately, because I may have, uh, do I have time or can I go to the next one or can I get five, 10 minutes or have I exceeded the time? We'll, we'll, we'll pause here, Vin, and then see yeah. if there's questions and move on. Okay, so should I stop here? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, okay, All right. okay. So I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, yeah, I think I'll take the questions at the end and then if you have any questions, we can, we can uh, go to the second session later. Right. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. So I'll let me just show you my the last graph, which I have to give the acknowledgement for um, the lab. Um, so pretty much everything that I've, fund, uh, I've, I've shown here is has been funded by the the funding agencies, uh, both national and international. And this is my entire large um, sort of lab group, past, present. Uh, uh, which is still working with me. Most of them are still with me, and and some have already moved on. So thank you with this, and I'll I'll stop here, and I'll take the questions at the end, right? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Okay. If yeah. anyone has any questions, um, we can type them into the chat, or um, we can take a minute or two for in-person questions. If folks are typing, I might ask how, so Vin, did you check whether or not there's different fluidity levels for your 
Ah, for your tech yeah. Side. yeah, yeah. I actually did, in fact, uh, yeah, we did. I didn't uh, present the, the results here. What we found is, and we're, we're again, we, uh, part of the reason we didn't finish the Ploidy story is because the pandemic hit us. And so we stopped at only few taxa, but we are continuing that work now. And what we found is that that spiketum complex, which is the most notorious uh, species complex, um, the same, the primary taxa that is spiketum, Hidicum spiketum, this, that main species also shows mul uh, multiple ploidy level, all the way going up to 6x. So oh, wow. ploidy also has a role to play in this so-called diversity in, in morphological characters. The only thing is that we haven't found, you know, those, those nice correlation of, you know, higher ploidy means larger flowers and, you know, such yeah. those, those classic things we haven't found yet. But clearly ploidy is, imp is, is present in the species complexes and taxa that are very clean in the sense that, you know, taxonomically they're well-defined, molecular molecules are well-defined, they are mostly diploid. So oh. there is something about, yeah, the complexes and possibly ploidy. Oh, that's great. And I see Nicola has a hand up. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks very much for a great talk. That was really interesting. Um, so there were quite a few aspects that I'd like to know more about, but I, I just thought the first thing I'd want to ask you about, I really enjoyed the, the unsupervised machine learning approach. Mm. or sort of multivariate distinguishing mm. of morphology. So mm. um, maybe you could mention a little bit about it. What sort of information went into that analysis? Was it images or was it coded data? It was it was morphological data. So we coded, uh, we, uh, we it's, it was really like a standard morphological matrix, similar to what you would use for any PCA or cluster analysis. Uh, what we initially did was but we had about 100 plus uh, morphological characters that were scored across um, the species complex. So what we did was we, since we were interested in seeing uh, how the species, but the, I mean, we used the machine learning for the most complex of the problem, you know, in the sense that the species complex, which had the continuum, that's where we applied this mach machine learning uh, approach. And so what we did was when we knew that, you know, it was, let's say, coronarium stenopatellum complex that we were dealing with, we had we sampled all the coronariums across multiple populations, all the way to stenopatellum and all the intermediate forms. They were scored for these hundred characters. We then sort of brought it down by first looking at what were the sort of correlated traits. We made complex characters out of those correlated traits, and finally we brought it down to about twenty-four or thirty characters, and and that's where we applied this machine learning approach. And 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 we had very clear idea of you know like this. Like, like, let's say if it's brat shape uh, is separate from floral tube and all those measurements were then analyzed. So uh, this particular approach is interesting because it, you know, machine learning approaches are supposed to be data hungry and, you know, data heavy. While, you know, in, in morphology, you really can't have thousands and thousands of characters to be, to be measured. So we were working in a very low data space uh, for this approach. And so, of course, the, most of the machine learning was done by a computer scientist who was, who was our collaborator. And so it wasn't done by us, but we made sure that we understood what he was doing and, and that, you know, the biology was retained. So this is a, a unsupervised machine learning in terms of the um, cluster formation, okay, or, or in terms of the analysis. The part of uh, one can criticize the, that it is supervised because the number of clusters, right, was defined by us. So we, because we had this biological information from the wild, because we had seen that, you know, there were like six major, you know, forms that we could identify by eye. So we gave in the machine learning approach, we actually said that it cannot be two because two is too little. And then it cannot be eight because eight is too much and we couldn't find that geographic sort of differences. So we set that uh, bar saying it has to be between four and six. And then we saw, and what is interesting or what was really fun for us is to go through each of those different clusters. So we look at one cluster where the cluster identifies only four you know, taxa. And then we look at the cluster which has six taxa and you can see the individual taxa which is jumping into the different you know, clusters. And, and then the characters that it's, it's, you know, it's being supported by. 
so for me i still like this idea of machine learning although you know someone kind of did uh, throw in this criticism in one of our talks is that well it's not supervised it's not totally unsupervised because you chose the cluster and my argument is that it we have to choose because we have the domain expertise in this we are biologists and i have to be able to bring in my biology to say that you know it can't be more than 6 because i just can't see how the species can you know uh, have so much variations that you have now identifying uh, you know 6 or 8 different taxa so we did uh, there is some kind of supervision but it is informed decision from the ecological work that we had done and and so then we could use that and and the fact that you could see in the different analysis you know which taxa was the rogue taxa which was going in different clusters allowed us more information to understand what was happening with the species complex so that's that's what's the so the paper is published i mean you can find it on plant apps if you don't get the paper i can send it to you separately yeah, uh, if you're interested in exploring it yeah 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 thank you yeah yeah and and then sorry if i could if i could just add one more i don't know if i'm hogging the question but i don't see a no. lot of other hands so um um your structure analysis so it looked like there were maybe six good clusters there if you rearranged yeah. your bars but they obviously weren't fitting with morphology at all yes yes that's what it is so yeah, <laughs> yeah. so so um i mean if you if you threw all your sort of all the morphology out the window and just looked at genetics mm. is there anything coherent that would come out of this if you if you wait, were wait, accepting so cryptic taxa Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know so alina i think i think she's there in the audience somewhere uh, uh, i think uh, she can answer this alina do you want to answer for me but uh, the short answer is that no we tried every iteration so i really don't want to and uh, and uh, sort of like i said i would really like to see structure in my structure plot but i'm not going to force myself to see it and we have really resisted not you know doing that but we have not we've looked at like you know like the you know, bars which are similar colored are really in completely different states so i have to invoke multiple dispersal events to why this tax size you know so one is really up north and one is really in the eastern part of northeast of india the only thing could be which is something that alina i mean this is part of her phd she's she's still working on it and we have more data we're actually resampling some more taxa uh, the only thing i could think of we could come up with is like what if like you know someone sort of carried it as a garden plant and then it you know somehow you know went out and we happened to sample that so we are coming up with such convoluted you know arguments but um i don't know i i yeah i think the simplest uh, answer is that i think there is not much structure because it's more recent that really is the more simpler answer otherwise i'll have to like explain long stories you know which i'm not comfortable with right now <laughs> so but i hope maybe we will we'll add more taxa we're adding more 40 more taxa for 40 more samples to this analysis and hopefully that will improve or it will remain the same and that i think in a year's time i'll be in a better position to answer your question yeah okay yeah. thank you yeah thanks nicola thanks ben i see one question from um glennis and she's in Did you find distinct pollinators linked to the various chemical signals and how were the pollinators affected by hybridization? Yeah, this this is a tragedy question for me because I started this project wanting to uh, identify diurnal and nocturnal pollinators in this absolutely fascinating genus which has, you know, color polymorphism that is, you know, you have white flowers which is classic plant nocturnal uh, species and then we have, you know, bright colored which are so called diurnal we didn't see any pattern anywhere and i cannot emphasize this that i'm not going to force myself into it and preeti i mean if she was here she would have told you know pretty much like you know bold on this and that she tried everything to find the pollinator she couldn't find we couldn't find how, how the pollen was getting transmitted and trust me when i say this that we did everything to we put camera traps we did we did visual observations we did multiple populations and we did see fruit sets and but again they are selfing so or, or they are self compatible so we don't know what is causing it but our pollinators were like wake bees and you know butterflies random things there was nothing that was like interesting so while i'm still talking about chemical signals and i still think it's happening somewhere we haven't found it and the only group so far which has found the chemical trait and has correlated correlated with ecology is this one group in from xtvg in china but they worked with uh, this particular species in the botanical garden where it was planted 
So I'm not even sure if that's really, you know, how it happens in the wild. And so one of our uh, strange theories now is that, you know, we, of course, this group had pollinators, the taxa may, the morphology may have evolved to that, but the pollinators have gone extinct. And so now it's like sort of open field to who pollinates what. And since the compatibility is so bad, so anyone which comes is going to hybridize it. And therefore there's no pattern of hybridization as well because these are all sort of you know uh, uh, not, uh, generalized pollinators that are visiting so unfortunately glenn is it don't have a very interesting sexy answer for you <laughs> so it's quite it's quite clunky <laughs> yeah. uh, i'm kind of happy to hear that because we're not entirely sure how pollen's moving around our plant group either so <laughs> it's, it's yeah i, I have yeah, I have a theory that, you know, I think a lot of this um, pollinator movement is is people's imagination, <laughs> like, you know, because I, that's how I would like it. But, you know, that's not how it's happened. But how many times do you do replicates to actually prove that, right? So yeah. I have to say that I'm right now in that position where I'm sort of the skeptic who's like sitting on the edge of saying, you know, there is no species boundaries clearly in a lot of tropical plants. And who knows how the pollinators are doing it. But I still believe in it. So I'm going to work towards it. But in 10 more years, I'll let you know, you know what <laughs> my actual thing. <laughs> so... Great, thanks, Vin. And then, so we're gonna move on to our student presentations now. Uh, Jess is gonna come up first. If there are other questions, please type them into the chat and we can hold them for the end. So with that, Jessica, if you'd like to share your screen, we'd love to hear about your work. Okay, Kelsey, can you see my screen? Yep, all set. Okay. So I'm excited to be presenting um, part of my PhD research where we're looking at the drivers of species diversification in Galtonia, which is a genus near endemic to the Drakensberg. So the Drakensberg Mountain Center um, has considerable species richness and endemism. And two subcenters of endemism are recognized in the DMC, which is the um, Malorti Alpine subcenter and the Drakensberg Montane subcenter. And comprising two thirds of the DMC, the Drakensberg Montane subcenter has approximately 81 endemic species, which are restricted to the region, while the Malorti Alpine Center has about 39 endemic species. And within the Drakensberg Mountain Center, approximately 37% of the DMC's flora is limited to the eastern region of South Africa, with approximately 63% of the DMC's endemics confined to the KwaZulu-Natal Drakensberg, which is recognized as a center of rare and endemic species. However, only a small proportion of the DMC is conserved and approximately 55% of the plants in the DNC are either red or orange data listed. Therefore, conservation of the region needs to be prioritized, especially um, the evolutionary processes that have led to the speciation of such a diverse region. And compared to the cave floristic region, relatively few studies have investigated speciation and patterns of diversity in the Drakensberg Mountain Center. Therefore, investigating the drivers of speciation um, in the genus Galtonia will contribute to our understanding of the processes that have resulted in such a remarkably diverse region. Galtonia belongs to the subfamily Ornithogaloidae in the family Hyacinthaceae, and they are mainly distributed in the summer rainfall regions of Eastern South Africa. Traditionally, four species are included in the genus. However, recent phylogenetic studies have proposed the inclusion of a fifth species, Galtonia sarnesii, in the genus. And these species are mainly characterized by large leaf sheathing the stem, erasmus inflorescence, and nodding flowers that form a campanulate tube. So we aim to investigate the likely drivers of species um, diversification and evolutionary trends in Galtonia. 
In our initial study, we conducted a phylogenetic analysis of Galtonia using um, two plastid regions, the TR and LTR and F and MACK, and we also used a nuclear ITS regions on all species of Galtonia. And what we found is that Galtonia um, census strict two forms a monophyletic group. And Galtonia sonnesii is sister to that clade. And within Galtonia census strict two, Galtonia princeps and verdiflora are sister species. And Galtonia canicans form sister to that clade. And then we have Galtonia regalis, which is sister to the clay comprising canicans, princeps, and viridiflora. Galtonia species are each characterized by different tepal colors, except for the sister species, princeps, and viridiflora, which both have pale green tepals. Galtonia canicans, on the other hand, has white tepals, while Galtonia regalis has pale creamy yellow tepals. And similar to Galtonia canicus, Galtonia sinusii has white tepals, but as you can see, it is quite morphologically distinct from the other Galtonia species. Galtonia species also occur in different habitats. Galtonia princeps occurs in marshy areas along streams or rivers. While its sister Viridiflora occurs on dry cliffs and steep rubbly slopes. Galtonia canicans, on the other hand, it occurs in damp grassy hollows on mountain slopes, as well as among coarse grasses and bushes along forest margins. And compared to all the other species, Galtonia regalis mainly occurs on the wet shady cliffs of the Drakensberg escarpment. And when we looked at the distribution as well as the altitudinal ranges, we can see that Galtonia species mainly occur in the eastern to northeastern regions of South Africa. And as you can see, Galtonia sonnesii, which is represented by the orange circles, it mainly has a northerly distribution compared to Galtonia sensistrictu. And of the Galtonia species, Galtonia princeps, which are your yellow diamonds, has the most easterly distribution, and it also occurs at the lowest altitudinal ranges. Galtonia regalis, which are your green diamonds, they um, occur at the highest altitudes and have the most restricted distributions of the Galtonia species and occur in the upper montane zones in the Drakensberg. Galtonia beridiflora also occur in the upper montane zones in the Drakensberg, but compared to regalis, they mainly found in the Lesotho mountains and also occur at lower altitudes. And although Galtonia canicans has the most widespread distribution of the Galtonia species and also overlaps with regalis and beridiflora, it does occur at much lower altitudes um, in the upper and lower mountain bands of the Drakensberg. So we can conclude so far that Galtonia princeps and Viridiflora, because they have distinct distributions and occur at different altitudinal ranges uh, and occupy different habitats, that allopatric speciation occurred. And although the distribution of canicans overlap with Galtonia viridiflora and regalis, they do occur at much lower altitudes, suggesting that parapatric or sympatric speciation um, occurred. And then with regalis, due to its limited distribution and highest evolution um, elevations, parapatric or allopatric speciation um, may have occurred. So we then looked at the drivers of speciation to determine whether species diversification occurred in response to abiotic or biotic factors. And to do this, we measured the vegetative and flower characters. And some of the vegetative features we measured include plant height, leaf length, and leaf width. And you can see from plant height that our lower altitudinal species, Galtonia canicans and princeps, 
held much um, are much taller compared to our lower altitudinal species, I mean, our higher altitudinal species, Viridiflora and Regalis. And it's similar is observed with their leaf length and leaf width in that our lower altitudinal species have much thinner and longer leaves compared to our higher altitudinal species, Galtonia Regalis and Viridiflora. We conducted a principal component analysis based on these vegetative features. And you can see that our high altitudinal species, Galtonia regalis and Viridiflora, share similar vegetative features, while our lower altitudinal species, Princeps and Canicans, have much more similar vegetative features. To determine whether biotic factors such as pollinators played an important role in species diversification, we measured floral features such as perianth tube length and diameter. And then in our 2021 and 2022 flowering season, we also measured outer and inner lobe length as well as filament and style length. And we can see that perianth tube length and diameter only significantly differed between sister species Princeps and Viridiflora, as Viridiflora has much um, longer and more open flowers compared to Galtonia Princeps. And when we look at outer and inner lobe length, all three species have different outer and inner lobe length, so they're all different sizes. And we can see that Galtonia princeps has much smaller flowers, whereas Galtonia canicans has much larger um, flowers of all three species. And if we look at filament and style length, we can see that um, the filament length of our lower altitudinal species, canicans and princeps, were very similar. However, Sister species Princeps and Viridiflora do have similar style lengths. And when we combine these floral features um, in our PCA, we still get the same pattern that our higher altitudinal species share similar floral features and the lower altitudinal species share similar floral features. So Galtonia species show variation in their vegetative features, suggesting that Galtonia has adapted in response to the physical environment and that abiotic factors do also play a role in species diversification. However, we also observe very distinct variations in flower form, especially between sister species. However, the pollinators of Galtonia species had not been formally investigated and we wanted to see if the main floral um, pollinators and visitors differed among Galtonia species. So in the 2021-2022 flowering season, we set out to investigate the roles of pollinators in species diversification by identifying the main floral visitors and comparing them to floral traits such as its nectar properties, to determine if these traits can be linked to the main flower visitors or pollinators. And we investigated sister species Viridiflora and Princeps, as well as Galtonia canicans. And what we found is that Galtonia princeps is visited by a variety of sunbirds, including amethyst, greater double collars, and malachite sunbirds. Um, and amethyst sunbirds contributed majority of bird visits, which was and followed by our greater double collared sunbirds. Galtonia princeps was also visited by a array of insects, but they were mostly visited by honeybees. And if we looked at their nectar properties, and I won't go into too much detail here, but the nectar volume, um, so Galtonia princeps produces high volumes of relatively concentrated nectar, indicative of specialist bird pollination, which does link it to our main um, floral visitor. And if we looked at its sister species, we had very few floral visitors and we mainly observed honeybees, bee flies, and we did observe one malachite sunbird. 
And if we compare this to its nectar properties compared to princeps, Galtonia varidiflora produced much lower volumes of nectar with high sugar concentration, which is indicative of insect pollination. And lastly, Galtonia canicans, we only observed honeybees. And if we looked at their nectar properties, it had similar nectar properties to princeps, which showed it mostly conformed to specialist bird pollination. So we can conclude that due to the distinct geographical and altitudinal distribution, speciation in allopatry or parapatry is hypothesized to occur. And each species have contrasting habitat preferences, suggesting that microhabitat specialization and ecological speciation played an important role in species diversification. And our sister species, Galtonia princeps and Verdiflora, have contrasting flower features, nectar properties, and different flower visitors. And although Galtonia canicans has, um, we only observed honeybees, its floral features and nectar properties were very similar to that of Galtonia princeps, and both these species occur in lower altitudes. So therefore, biotic factors such as pollinators is suggested to play an important role in species diversification. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. And are there, uh, I'll hold back for a second to see if there are any other questions. I feel like I get a chance to ask you a lot, so <laughs> I'll let other people can have I, it. Kelsey, can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. So, so Jessica, can you go back to that uh, vector slide that you had for the male and uh, the the uh, the specialist where you were talking about the specialist? Um, um, okay. I'll I think it back. was like the four, I so I didn't write down the number, but fourth or fifth slide. Um, to go back where well, like then you said that uh, this one right? This is the one. Oh, is so, it this one? Uh, I think oh, both of them have the. You're saying that the. Uh, so in, in both of the species, the female produces more nectar in the morning. Is that the trend? Right? Yes. Um, and they, yeah, sorry, because we did find that they are protandrous. So we measured both male phase and female phase flowers. Um, right. So, so, so is the specialization... Um, so why did you say they were special? Because they, I mean, the specialist part is coming from the fact that they were bird pollinated, is it? Yes. Yes. So okay. It, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but then, but then for the bee pollinated one, where the nectar is less, that's what you said, right? Yes. So variety flora produced much lower um, nectar volumes compared oh, okay. to both canicans and princeps. Um, oh, okay, but what I found interesting is that oh, although it's not significant, but is there any trend of the males being different as well? Like the males have more um, nectar here, uh, and and if you are a bee, then you know you you would want more pollen. So is it correlated by any chance? We did find that depending on um, the day, that nectar mm -hmm. did fluctuate between male and female phase of the plants. But generally, they did produce similar nectar volumes and concentrations. So if there were differences, they, they weren't that great. Okay. Huh. But, but, but the differences are more clear in the specialized, uh, in the bird pollinated yes. ones. Yes. Ah, yes. that's interesting, isn't it? Because yes. like why, you know, the, 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 the sex, um, you know, preference should be linked to nectar production. And I'm sure there's something to do with the visits and so on and so forth. Ah, interesting. Okay. I've never seen this result, so this is really nice. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Anita. Um, in interest of time, if others have questions, please can you type them into the chat? Thanks very much, Jess, for sharing your research with us. And Camille, can I please ask you to share your screen and tell us about your work?
Okay, Camille, we can see your screen. I'm not sure if you've unmuted yet. Sorry, I forgot about uh, unmuting. <laughs> no um, good afternoon. Uh, so uh, by sheer coincidence, my talk will also be about um, the drivers of diversification. But in my case, it's um, the tribe Apia, which is a group of highly aromatic umbellifer species. And that um, project is already closed. We published the results some time ago. So um, in our case, what we wanted to understand is how life form and dispersal events affect diversification rates in tribe Apia. And we focus on life form and dispersal events because um, when we think about life form, we can think of it as a continuum from very herbaceous to very woody species. And those that are on the herbaceous end of that spectrum, they tend to have very pronounced R reproductive strategy. And at the same time, they tend to have short generation times. So um, both of these traits, they can inflate the, or accelerate the um, rate of accumulation of mutations. And that in turn can lead to inflated speciation rates. On the other hand, we were also interested in dispersal events because they can <clears throat> decrease the, um, the rate of extinction because if a plant or animal or any other creature that we want to study uh, disperse from one area to another and then it uh, dies off in that ancestral area, we can assume that it uh, escaped extinction due to that dispersal event. At the same time, if the dispersal event is of the long distance type, it will establish some genetic uh, barriers or gene flow barriers and inflate speciation. So this is why we decided to study life form and dispersal events in tribe Apia. And why did we uh, decide to, to study Apia? Uh, that's because the group is comparatively small and it might be counterintuitive to study diversification in a small group, but on the other hand, it allows us to have a very good coverage, very good taxonomic coverage. And in fact, we included almost all of the currently recognized uh, species in Apia. Some of them are very well known, like parsley, fennel, dill, uh, celery, and so on. The second thing is that uh, Apia has very wide distribution. So we have European, New Zealand, Australian, South American, South African species. So even if we don't know the biogeographic scenario beforehand, we can assume that multiple dispersal events took place. Um, the third thing is that they also show high diversity of life forms. So the best known species like parsley, for example, or uh, celery, they tend to be on the herbaceous end of that spectrum. But at the same time, we have the Verra and Bilburtia, and these two genera, they grow as shrubs. So we have this whole diversity of, of life forms. And at the same time, the rest of the traits, for example, uh, leaves, uh, fruits, flowers, chemical composition, uh, all of them tend to be very uniform. And since we have this uniformity, they even if they affect the diversification rates in some way, they should affect diversification rates in all clades uh, in the same way and to the same degree. So it reduces the amount of background noise that we see in our results. So what we did was uh, this first we resolved the phylogeny of, of Apia, and then we calibrated that phylogeny and having that uh, chronogram, we used the chronogram for sequent analysis. Uh, the first analysis was um, to establish uh, which... Sorry to oh. interrupt, but the slides are not moving forward. Oh, really? Thanks. And uh, where are you stuck? On which one? On the, the first one. Oh, and I already am on the fourth, actually. So maybe I will start. Then it's moved now. Okay. And how about now? Yeah. Okay. So sorry for that. Um, actually, it, like from my perspective, everyone, everything was working. So I don't know what's going on. Anyway. Um, so uh, the first thing we did was that we started with um, diversification analysis 
And um, by that, we wanted to understand which clade uh, diversified at a rate different from the rest of the, of the tribe. And it turns out that there is only one clade that is the Southern Hemisphere Apium or Southern Hemisphere uh, Celery. This is the clade I marked in red. And this is the only clade to diversify at a rate higher uh, than typical for the rest of the clade. Actually, it was uh, a rate three times higher than typical for Apia as a whole. Um, the second thing is that we use the same chronogram to understand how um, the, bio, the biogeographical scenario uh, took place. And it turns out that the whole group, the whole tribe, most likely originated somewhere in northwestern Africa, most likely in Morocco. And then they dispersed to different areas around the world. So, for example, we have one dispersal event from northwestern Africa to Canary Islands. We have another one to the Azores. We have also one to Madagascar, but we also um, identified a number of very long scale dispersal events, for example, from the Saharo Arabian Africa to South Africa in case of the Verra. But what is most important is that most of those um, dispersal events took place within one clade, and that was the same clade that had the highest diversification rates. Actually, some of the routes that we resolved were, well, counterintuitive. So, for example, we found out that Apium Fernandesianum, which is an endemic of Juan Fernandez Island, quite close to South America, um, it arrived in Juan Fernandez Archipelago from Australia and not from South America as one could expect. At the same time, Apium filiforme, which is endemic of New Zealand, it arrived to New Zealand from South America and not from, Aus from Australia as one could as expect again. So the most, uh, mo most of the, diversity, uh, the, the dispersal events were located within that one clade of Apium. The next thing we did was that we used the same chronogram to reconstruct how life form evolved in um, Apia. And it turns out that life form is very changeable. And the second thing that the most important um, message from that part of the study was that we didn't see any correlation between uh, diversification rate analysis and the life form history. So if we take a look at the Southern Hemisphere Apium, we will see that it's more or less the same when it comes to life form as its sister clade. However, unlike uh, its sister clade, Apium diversifies at the rate three times higher. So we concluded that most likely life form is not uh, instrumental when it comes to diversification rates, at least in this particular tribe. Uh, what was most interesting for me was um, the evolution of woodiness because I usually um, study wood. And it turns out that woodiness could have evolved either once or twice. We have uh, the woody species marked in blue here. Uh, but anyway, wh whichever um, scenario was correct, it must have evolved around 10 million years ago. Uh, at the same time, from our biogeographic scenario, we know that the Vedra and Vilburtia originated in northwestern Africa, or in general, let's say, in Saharo Arabian region. And around 10 million years ago, that is in the late Miocene, that region was affected by very pronounced uh, climate aridification. So it suggests that there may be some link between evolution of woodiness and climate aridification. And in fact, there is a number of studies that uh, suggest <clears throat> that plants can evolve woodiness as a response to aridification because woody species, they tend to be less susceptible to drought. Basically, woodier species, they can cope with uh, embolism, that is development of air bubbles, better than herbaceous ones. And uh, this is why, um, I mean, like at least one theory assumes that this is why um, in arid climate, woodier species like in the Mediterranean climates tend to dominate. Um, so when it comes to conclusion, we can say that at least in tribe Apia, we didn't see any correlation between diversity of morphology, in this case, life form and diversification rate. So probably life form is not um, affecting the, the, the rates of speciation and, and extinction. 
The only clade that we identified as having higher diversification rates was the one which experienced the most long distance dispersal events, and that was the Appium from Southern Hemisphere. And at the same time, we also, um, we also found out that woodiness evolved around 10 million years ago, and that was probably linked to climate aridification. I also included mild climate here because um, in case of Bilbourg, yeah, the story might be a little bit more complex, but for details, I invite you to download the, the paper and I'm also happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Camille. I was, while people are typing their questions or formulating their questions, I, I was wondering about your long distance dispersal. I saw there mm -hmm. was, is there one, did I read this correctly, that it's from South America to Australia? Uh, let me, let me open that again. Uh, from South America to, sorry. Oops. Problems with presentation today. From South America yeah. to Australia, yes. Yes. How, how would that how, how how can I'm trying to think of the time frame and where where the continents were at that point because it's quite a distance and it didn't like it wouldn't have stopped <laughs> over anywhere. So I think the distribution of continents would be more or less the same because it was only. Hmm. Um, hmm. I don't know what's going on with that presentation because it was more or less like two point five million years ago. So the yeah. uh, so distribution would be the same. But um, Appium, um, Appium is the only um, group in tribe Appia, uh, mm -hmm. which is um, mostly connected to aquatic environments. So uh -huh. probably that would be connected to like moving of, uh, of birds migrating from one area to another. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this is what we assumed. Um, well, it, it, otherwise that would be quite unlikely, I think. Mm, yeah, that that makes sense. With if you especially as you, as you take a look at Appium, we also had this one from Australia to Juan Fernandez. Yeah, mm -hmm. that the one that I had mentioned. So the natural thing would be to assume that they arrive from um, to Juan Fernandez from South America. Yeah, basically mm -hmm. Juan Fernandez belongs to Chile, if I remember correctly, and the same with New Zealand. But mm. it's it it wasn't the case. Yeah, and actually we had quite good support for both of those um, reconstructions. Yeah, very cool. Um, and I see, I see there's a hand up. Um, trying to figure out who it oh, is. Oh, that's me, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so a quick question from a very nice talk is, um, so the, the woody part, I don't think I, I mean, I was not able to see it properly. So, it's, so the, which ones are the woody? plants that the, okay. the blue ones yes right so um, so so you're saying that woodiness or what you found is that woodiness evolved twice but does that have uh, does that did you find any correlations of that woodiness with the diversity in increasing no or no so, it is um, not, it's just a ecological sort of a yes yeah, so, so Woodiness might have evolved once or twice. Actually, it's uh, it's not quite um, it, Please, it's not uh, fully resolved. Yes, right. Um, yeah. It might have evolved in the common ancestor of the Vedra and Vilburtia. Yeah, it might mm -hmm. have evolved twice. What mm -hmm. we know is that it evolved around ten million years ago, like mm -hmm. somewhere between let's say nine point five and eleven point mm -hmm. five. It's the same time that this area, um, by which I mean the the Saharo Arabian region. Uh, was experiencing the, the aridification and the Vedra is mostly concentrated in that area. So I think that, well, there is this link, it's not causal uh, link, mm. but at least there is this correlation between mm -hmm. uh, woodiness and aridification in case of the Vedra. In case of Bilbutia, yeah, the story might be uh, more complex because uh, this is the uh, Malagasy, Malagasy endemic, and it's mm -hmm. um, basically, um, it grows in high tropical tropical mountains. So mm -hmm. another 
um, theory that explains evolution of woodiness, derived woodiness, because this is the kind of mm. um, woodiness that we see here, woodiness that is derived from a herbaceous ancestor, assumes that woodiness may evolve as a response to mild climate. So if plants can just postpone uh, mm. generative uh, reproduction, they grow and grow and become woodier, mm -hmm. basically. And um, in the case of mm. Bilbutia, we obviously don't know when that woodiness evolved. It could have evolved here at the split. It could have evolved somewhere here before those two species um, diversified, yeah? because their common ancestor di diversified into those two species that we observe today. And um, depending on what our interpretation would be, if woodiness evolved somewhere here at the split, we would assume that probably that was also a response to aridification. If they evolved woodiness only after dispersal to mm. Madagascar, then we could e expect woodiness to be a response to mild climate. Yeah, especially that in, um, in those mountains, we also see number of not closely related, but also umbellifer species that have the same life form. So also woody like Tana, Cannaboides, Pseudocannaboides and so on. So it makes sense to, to assume that there is another explanation as well. Mm. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, Glynis already, this was what I was trying to also next get to is that I, again, my imagination or my perception was that um, uh, APMs are mostly annuals. Is that correct or no? Mm. There is, or maybe well, there is no pattern. I don't know. Is, is there any pattern? I, I, I would say that uh, you, you mean like umbellifers in general, yeah? Yeah, yeah, umbellifers, yeah. Okay. Do they so, tend to be so more animals and not they tend to be They tend to be on the herbaceous side, yes, yes. But woodiness evolves multiple times. So we have, right. um, for example, in South Africa, we have um, the whole group, which is derived woody. In Macaronesia, that is uh, Madeira and so on, mm -hmm. uh, derived woody. We, we also have derived woody carrots. You know, mm, uh, now you, you can Google uh, mm -hmm. Melanocelinum decipiens, which mm -hmm. now is was moved to Daucus decipiens, that is carrot, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it grows up to four meters and have um, stem mm -hmm. that is five, six, seven um, centimeters in width. So, yeah, it evolves Amazing. pretty in, in many, many not really related groups. Yeah, it's really, really amazing, really quite impressive. Yeah, cool. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Thank I you. see there's a question from Glynis in the chat. Glynis, do you want to ask? Thanks, Kelsey. Um, so I was just interested in the same um, image that you have up here showing the various life forms that the, the clade that is diversifying the fast is the one with mostly the perennial herbs. Whereas the sister clade, which has a mix of the theriophytes and the hemicryptophytes, is, mm -hmm. is not as fast. And usually annuals are thought to diversify faster than perennials. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. So actually, that could be one of the reasons why we assume that life form is um, not instrumental in, the, in inflating diversification rates in uh, apium as a group. Um, and that's because, well, first of all, we, we have to have this at least a theoretical link between a trait and how it affects speciation and extinction. In case of life form, the, the link would be that herbaceous species, they tend to specify at, uh, speciate at higher rates. So here we have an opposite uh, pattern. The less herbaceous and more woody species, the hemicryptophytic species, they diversify at higher rates. Um, and this is very counterintuitive. So, well, we, we didn't have any explanation how to link that kind of life form with high diversification rates. And this is why we had to, we were forced to um, just forget about that, that, that part, yeah? And assume that probably life form is not um, important in, in uh, inflating the speciation rates. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, so, Unless sorry, someone come, come Yeah, Camille, um, so I, 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 sorry to interject, but I think mm -hmm. uh, what, what Glynis, I, well, I, I would interject here just to say that I think 
I don't know. The way I start thinking about it is more in terms of the environment. What is that specific environment? What kind of uh, uh, you know uh, plant habit the environment supports? For instance, in hedicums, these are perennials. And like I said, you know, the perennial basically means that you know the, the shoot comes out annually, but it is a perennial because of the rhizome. Is that the hybrid just has to establish itself, as in have a viable rhizome for one year. And then it can just be there, you know, vegetatively reproducing till the environment gets better. Maybe that is a much more advantageous, uh, you know, sort of strategy that we haven't really looked at because we have been always assuming that selection happens annually and we see mm -hmm. annual is a much faster time period, which is true. If, you know, if you think of it as a, from a Drosophila's perspective that, you know, you know, you, you have like three days is, is there or five days, whatever is their life cycle, then, you know, it's faster, uh, you know, than, than a plant. But I'm starting to think that that perennial behavior sort of habit actually give, may be a very important uh, uh, okay. selection trait. That is, you know, you're able to go through the whatever environmental stress for one year. And that's why you are seeing this higher speciation events or diversification in perennial plants, which is counterintuitive, yes. But I think it's happening because that's what even our trees are showing, and which is what even, you know, your tree is showing for APM. So uh, I think it's a matter of, I think, us sort of like, changing our viewpoints of looking at perennials and annuals differently, I think, you know? Yes, actually maybe, um, maybe perennial habit or let's say hemicryptophytic habit, it works in harness with a dispersal effect. So once we right. have a herbaceous species, yeah, that the very herbaceous species, because I always tend to think about um, life form in continuum. So if we have this very herbaceous species and it moves to a new area, and then it establishes and we only have like one or two specimens in that area and they don't get to reproduce in that first year, mm -hmm. they die off, yeah? And right. when it comes to hemicryptophytes, they can prolongate themselves through mm -hmm. other means, yeah? So mm -hmm. this is basically what, yeah. what can be uh, quite favorable in case of those long distance dispersal events, especially when the, the barrier, um, mm -hmm. It's established between the new and the old population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Certainly, it in, can have some some influence. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks, Nina. Thanks, Emil. Are there Thank any you. other questions? Okay. Just a second. Um, if not, I'd like to. Uh, become present here. There we go. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers for sharing their research with us. It's really exciting to see as like as a plant evolutionary virologist, it's really exciting to see all the different ways that plants are evolving into new spaces and characters are evolving in all different taxa. Um, so thank you very much for being here with us today and thanks Benita for giving us a, a great insight into Hedicium. And I know I feel a bit better about my structure graphs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to feel, anyone who wants to feel better, <laughs> visit my lab, <laughs> you'll feel very good <laughs> with a kind of complex, you know, un, un, you know, zero conclusion results that we have, so. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks very much to everyone who has attended. We really appreciate having you here. So, and thanks, Venice Thank and the Fabi team for another seamless webinar. Thank you very much and goodbye. Enjoy your evening. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. <laughs> See you.